Good morning. Welcome to my office. I'm sorry, it's so messy. <laughs> I share with my husband, so it's not all my fault. Well, most of it is, but not all of it. Okay, this morning I'd like to do a reading for you. And I've never done this before so on video, so we'll see how this goes. You won't meet the hero in this section. You're going to meet a fellow called Lord Weatherford, and he's kind of the foil in the story. Uh, but he's a rake, and so Aunt Honora has instructed the girls to never use his name so that no one thinks they're associated with him. They met him on the journey to London. So Aunt Honor has come to take Kate away because she's had an embarrassing breakup with her fiance because she's so bossy. The thing is, Kate had to raise her younger sisters. Her mother died in childbirth with Tilly, the youngest, and that has been 11 years ago. So for 11 years ago, she's essentially had to be a mother to three younger sisters. So she's trying to adapt here and, and Aunt Honor has taken her way to London to mend her broken heart. So we'll see. Oh, and my can't, I, you guys, I'm, this is so unprofessional. This whole, my phone is being held in place by some, you know, those bread ties. So if it slips sideways, you'll, you'll know it's, it's, yeah, it's, what do they call it? Held together by bailing wire and chewing gum. <laughs> That's how my whole life is pretty much. Okay, so here's the book. It's the latest book, The Persuasion of Miss Kate. And in this story, you'll, you'll meet Lady Jersey, who's one of my favorite character, real life people in the Regency era. <clears throat> but first, you're meeting Kate. Wake up, Katie. Someone, namely Tilly, rudely, rudely jostled, oh, and forgive my stumbling, I do my best, but I'll get words wrong, you can just hang with me. Okay, we'll start again. Wake up, Katie. Someone, namely Tilly, rudely jostled her shoulder. Katie, you have to wake up. It's too early, Kate grumbled, tossing to her other side and covering her head with the pillow. Go back to sleep, Tilly. Tilly lifted the corner of the pillow and invaded Kate's inner sanctum of sleep. But Katie, she whispered, it isn't early. It's 2.30 in the afternoon, and I've been up for hours. More importantly, Lord Weatherbottom is here to see Nora. He brought her the most enormous banquet of flowers I have ever seen. No, bouquet of flowers, sorry. He brought her the most enormous bouquet of flowers I have ever seen. Tilly wriggled so close her breath tickled Kate's nose. And that's not all. He gave her a box of tiny little cakes. I ate one and it was divine. He even brought a bottle of French wine for Aunt Honor. He keeps asking if he might speak to you, but Aunt Honor told him no, that we should not waken a sleeping tiger. But he says it is a matter of grave importance and that he cannot possibly wait. Tilly stopped yammering and poked her finger in Kate's ear. Did you hear me, Katie? I think he means to ask you for permission to court Nora. What? Kate yanked the pillow off her head and sat up. What did you say? Tilly harumphed, the same exact way Aunt Honor does. You heard me. He's acting like a lovesick donkey. You mean a lovesick monkey, Kate corrected and tried to rub the sleep out of her eyes. I said donkey because I was trying not to say jackass, but if you prefer, no, 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 donkey is fine. Tilly stood atop the mattress and peered sternly down at Kate. I don't think you understand. He won't stop staring at Nora, even though Aunt Honor told him to mind his manners and start behaving like a grown man instead of an idiot schoolboy. Tilly gestured broadly with her hands. He didn't even get mad about that. He just sighed and kept smiling so stupidly that it makes me wonder if something is broken in his head. Tilly began jig jiggling up and down as if testing the mattress ticking. Sadie thinks it is all vastly entertaining, and she refuses to do a thing about it. You have come you have to come down and straighten things out now. 
Kate felt as if she had an anvil teetering atop her head, and her mouth was stuffed with cotton wadding. No doubt the after effects of laudanum. She blinked groggily at Tilly, who kept bobbling all over the bed. For pity's sake, Tilly, hold still. Are you coming down or not? She said in her agitated state. No, wait. In her agitated state, Tilly did not refrain from bouncing. If you won't come down, I shall tell him to go away and never come back. I doubt he will listen to me, but at least I will try. You will do nothing of the sort. Proper young ladies do not issue such demanding statements to gentlemen callers. You do, or you would if you'd get up and go downstairs. I would not, or at least not anymore. And young ladies do not bounce on beds either. You are in London now and... Kate was too parched to continue. Hand me a glass of water, will you? Why are you in your underclothes? Tilly leapt off the bed and poured a glass of lemon water from a pitcher. You told me I must always wear my nightgown so I would be modestly clad in case of a fire. Don't you care about your own modesty? Kate gulped down the lemon water and decided to ignore Tilly's question. I will get dressed as soon as I can and come down to assess my, for myself the situation with Lord Weatherford. Tilly studied Kate for a moment before her mouth twitched sideways. Um, you're going to need some help. Your hair looks like you got trampled at the opera. Kate reached up and felt the tangles encircling her head. Don't be ridiculous. You know perfectly well I was not at an opera last night. And anyway, one does not get trampled at the opera. One might if one is at the opera house and fire breaks out. And who knows what else might happen at one of those places. Tilly stopped her infernal bounding around and planted her fists on her hips and narrowed a frown at Kate. And that addle-pated Lord Weatherdrizzle has asked permission to take Nora to the opera. Ah, there it is, the opera. But she can't. She's too young for such things. She'll never fend him off in one of those dark private boxes. Did Aunt Hanor tell him no? Oh, of course not. One cannot rely upon her to do anything sensible. Never mind. I will put a stop to this. You find a hairbrush and I'll put on a morning gown. Ten minutes later, Kate emerged fully clothed, albeit in a wrinkled dress and mismatched stockings. But at least she wasn't naked and her hair no longer resembled an unruly lion's mane. It didn't matter that Tilly had yanked out several handfuls while taming it. Which way, Kate demanded, wishing the white curving walls and all the Greek goddesses carved into them did not make her feel quite so dizzy. Tilly crooked her finger and scampered ahead of her. Follow me. Kate held the rail as they rushed down a wide alabaster staircase that curled around four stories to a sitting room on the second floor. Nora, Kate barked, bursting into the room, ready to rescue her helpless cub of a sister and finding it inhabited not by one disreputable male as she's expected, as she had expected, but by a half dozen or more gentlemen. Suitors. Kate could tell by their meticulously tied cravats, their artistically combed hair and their gleaming buckle shoes and their preening stances, but why? Why were they here? And why this great number? So many gentlemen and flower arrangements littered the sitting room that it was difficult to ascertain a head count. Small, tasteful bouquets were strewn on side tables and the fireplace mantel, but on the tea table in front of a large sofa sat a massive arrangement of roses, lilies, and bright yellow flowers. The overpowering scent made Kate's nose itch. Mine too. She took a step backward, regretting she hadn't even more care she hadn't taken more care with her appearance, wishing they weren't all staring at her. These were obviously gentlemen of the highest rank, and Kate stood in their midst, dressed like a farm girl on wash day. Her throat was already dry, withered as if she had swallowed ashes. This was no way to begin her assault on London high society. Turn and run. Before she could obey her inner, sanct her inner dictum, 
Lord Weatherwhistle sprang up as if he'd spotted the queen. There you are, Miss Lynette. Finally, I've been waiting all morning for an audience with you. Might I have a private word? Here, Kate managed to gasp. It seemed as if every eye in the room was trained on her, leaning in to hear her answer. I, I... Aunt Honor stood and brushed out her skirts, not that hers were wrinkled. I tried to tell you, I tried to tell him you were indisposed today. Let me do that again. <clears throat> I tried to tell him you were indisposed today. Nonsense, Lord Weather Weasel argued. She looks hale and hearty enough. Why, I've seen milkmaids less sturdy. He patted her shoulder as if they were old friends. Isn't that so? He squinted, taking a harder look. Well, hmm. Admittedly, she might look a little bit white around the gills, but nothing a little biscuit and some tea won't cure. Isn't that so? When she didn't answer, he backed up a step. Er, you do know, don't you, my dear, that you've one pink stocking on your left foot and a lavender one on your right. Kate experienced a split second of gratitude that she did not have a loaded pistol in her hand for she most certainly would have shot him. As it was, both hands balled into tight fists and her right foot arched with an intense desire to kick his left kneecap across the room. My stockings should be of no concern to you, sirrah. At that, he backed up in alarm. Oh, I meant no disrespect, Miss Lynette. Quite the opposite. Your well-being is of primary importance to me, for I hope to be closely connected with you in the future. He glanced over his shoulder, grinning broadly at Nora, who sat barely visible behind the roses and lilies. Kate glared at him. Such talk is woefully premature, my lord. Aunt Hanor, Aunt Hanor let out an enormous sigh. I tried to tell him as much. He simply will not listen to reason. At that moment, Lady Alameda's elderly butler stepped into the doorway. Milady, pardon the intrusion. Lady Jersey has arrived. Are you at home? Lady Jersey? The Lady Jersey? Surely not. Suddenly dizzy, Kate reached for the side table to support herself. Before Aunt Honor could answer, a grand lady swept through the doorway. Don't be a fussy duck, Carn. She is always at home to me. The lady bustled forward and took in the surroundings, the numerous gentlemen strewn, strewn about the room and the flowers crowding every surface. She paused briefly, glancing her down her nose at Kate and leaned forward to kiss each of Honor's cheeks, as do the French aristocracy. Honor laughed gaily. Lady Jersey, what an unexpected surprise. It is Lady Jersey, the most illustrious of the patronesses of Almax. Admission through the hallowed doors of Almex Social Club require a voucher card, and those coveted cards had to be signed, sealed, and issued by one of the seven lady patronesses. Kate stepped back, bumping against the side table, pulling Tilly in front of her to hide her shabby ensemble. If only she had dressed with more care. Any young lady hoping for an advantageous marriage might wait weeks or even months for an audience with one of these formidable patronesses. In point of fact, one might never even be granted an audience at all. Yet to Kate's utter astonishment and embarrassment, Lady Jersey stood right here in her aunt's drawing room. If only the great lady hadn't come today of all days. When Kate looked like, when Kate looked such a rumpled frumpkin, Kate contemplated crawling under the thick Turkish rug to hide. On the other hand, Maybe she was still dreaming, trapped in a horrid, laudanum-driven nightmare. She pinched her arm hard. No, still here. I'll stop there. I hope you've enjoyed this and forgiven. Oops, <laughs> there. Oh, the camera held together. Um, forgiven my stumbling. You have a good morning, and it's been a delight. Talk to you later. Bye.